Welcome everyone, thank you for joining. In today's video, we're gonna be talking about Apple. Apple's a company that right now trades at 161.9 per share. So about $162 per share. And Apple's a company, a stock that is going to be trading at $250 per share, according to Gene Munster. He is an Apple analyst. This type of change from 160 currently to 250 would be around a 55% upside. So that's a significant amount of upside. Now he believes this is gonna happen over just the course of the next year or so. And Gene Munster so far has been pretty accurate with his predictions on Apple. So in this video, we're gonna look at an interview with Gene Munster. We're gonna react to what he has to say. He went on the CNBC and explained his thesis for it. I'll share my thoughts along with what he says as well as my thoughts on their latest event. Apple just recently had their peak performance event where they launched a few new products. They have their new chip, the M1 Ultra, which is this massive chip that of course has these incredible specs with it. They have the Mac Studio, the Studio Display. They have a new phone color for the iPhone that's this kind of cool green. Uh, they have a new starter iPhone that has actually their best iPhone chip in it. So overall, we have a lot to get into. We're gonna go over Apple as an investment, the potential upside, the potential downside, and why I continue to hold this company even though I'm significantly in the green on it. I've already made good gains on it, but I continue to hold it, and I plan on explaining why. Now, as always, before we jump into Apple and the analysis there, I have to give a quick portfolio update. This is my tech portfolio called the Story Fund, and I give updates on this transparently every single week, week by week. So if you subscribe to the channel, you can follow along with the progress of this portfolio completely transparent on a weekly basis. The reason I do that is because so many content creators don't really show transparency. They don't show what they're doing. They don't show their investments and how they're really performing. They just give generic advice and they only highlight their investments when things are going well. So on this channel, you see the full picture. You see when we're in the red, you see when we're in the green and everything in between. So I'll continue to give updates. You can subscribe and follow along for free. Now, so far right now, the portfolio is in the red overall by $12,100. So it looks really ugly, but just today we're up $4,000, 3.9% in the green. So we're having a very good day. And if we have more of these type of days where the, the bear market kind of comes to a close and we get back into bullish mode, I think a lot of these companies will really take off. That's kind of what I'm waiting for. So in the meantime, I'm waiting patiently. Now, if I benchmark this against the S&P 500, my portfolio is the blue line and the S&P 500 is the red line. So you can see a couple months ago when the, the real correction and bear market really started to happen, both of them traded down, but tech companies got hurt more. Now, just to further illustrate how difficult it's been to pick different tech companies to invest in recently, if we look at the Dip Finder, which is a tool I developed for patron members, you get this included as a Patreon. This shows you if any company's in a dip or in a price surge. If the bar is below the x-axis, if it's below zero, like Twilio here and Spotify and Facebook, that means it's in a dip. And the lower the bar, the bigger the dip. So Facebook is 42% below its 200 day moving average. Now, if we look at every single company in the story fund, all of them are in a dip except for one. There is one exception, which is Apple. This is the only company that's above its 200 day moving average out of every single one that I'm investing in. Most of them are in a dip, and most of them are in a significant dip. So looking at this overall, the market environment isn't one where you're gonna be doing well investing in tech companies. It really doesn't matter what you pick. So if you're a tech investor or you have a tech portfolio, you just have to be patient. You have to wait until the fear turns to greed, until these companies start to get back into bull mode and investors become bullish again, and the prices eventually will go back above their 200 day moving average. There will be bullish sentiment eventually with these companies, but in the meantime, you have to be patient, and that's what I plan on doing. Now, let's go ahead and move on to Apple. Like I outlined, Apple is one of the few companies, in fact, it's the only one right now that's not currently in a dip. In fact, if we look at the past five-year performance of Apple, it's been pretty incredible. It's up 366%. You've over three times your investment, three and a half times over the past five years. And that's excluding dividends, which Apple pays dividends the entire time. So factor that into the compounding, your returns are even better. Now, a lot of people look at these type of graphs and they say that the company's done so well. It's already done so well. It's already at such a high stock price, 162 after their stock split. The market cap is 2.65 trillion, which is just an incomprehensible number. The gains are probably behind it, right? Apple doesn't have 
much upside left. Well, that's what we're going to examine. How much upside does Apple have left? Because over the past five years, it's returned 366%. But if we look at Apple right now, if we go into this company, we can look at some of the fundamentals here and the valuation. Apple only trades at a 27 PE ratio. So even though the stock has gone up multiples, three or four times over just the past five years, it's still trading in the mid 20s PE ratio. And that seems pretty incredible. The valuation seems somewhat reasonable for a company that historically has absolutely crushed the market. So Apple's a two and a half trillion dollar market cap company. It trades at a mid 20s PE ratio. And in my opinion, it has a solid moat. But looking at future growth and how this company is going to continue to give shareholder value, that's the big debate. And one person that I like to get his perspective on is Gene Munster, who's an analyst that covers Apple. Here's a recent interview he did on CNBC. Check out some of the key highlights from today's Apple event. Tim Cook announcing a new budget iPhone, a new iPad Air, a brand new Mac featuring Apple's M1 Ultra chip, and a host of new colors for the iPhone 13. But the big event failed to woo investors. Apple finishing more than 1% lower. It's fourth straight down day. For more, let's bring in. One thing I'll note is rarely do I see Apple stock just soar after an Apple event. It always takes time for investors to realize what's going on. For whatever reason, I never see them wowed after an event and Apple stock soaring upwards. In fact, usually Apple stock moves up like a couple months after an Apple event. Loop Ventures partner, Gene Munster. Um, Gene, I don't know, it didn't seem that exciting, any of these things. It seemed kind of iterative. I mean, the, the chip is a kind of exciting, but other than that, what's the big deal here? Well, Melissa, just to put it into perspective, it may be constructive, is today we're talking about 5 to 10% of Apple's business is being upgraded. That compares to their fall event where 50% of the business gets upgraded. So by definition, this is going to be a smaller number of the products. And I think if we look at the products across the board, the iPhone SE, it is iterative. It's a small upgrade, uh, but it is a price increase. I think that is a critical piece here that's getting missed by a lot of investors. For them to actually raise price on their entry level product, I think it sets the tone for what their product demand is. And it's still really hard to get a hold of Apple products ultimately. So I think that's one of the going to be one of the big drivers here going forward is what the supply availability of these products are. And I think another piece that gets lost is they keep delivering despite all these headwinds. They keep coming out with these great products despite the fact that they've been working remote, supply chain issues. And I think that that is probably the most important takeaway here is that ultimately they continue to be the gold standard when it comes to putting great products out. And I think, uh, again, you're right, five to 10% of the revenue doesn't catch investors' attention, but I think it's important that they just step back and collectively look at uh, the body of work that Apple continues to put out. So he mentions that Apple's still delivering. They're, they're still doing the same thing they've always done. They don't fall off because of logistics, because of working at home. And they also continue to have pricing power. They raised the prices of the new lower end iPhone by 8%. So Apple's one of the companies that if inflation goes up 5%, 7%, no problem. They'll raise prices 8%. Uh, it's no big deal for Apple. They have enormous amounts of pricing power. Now, the next thing that Gene goes over is the $250 price target. And here's his breakdown of how he gets there. It is 250. It seems like a, a stretch case here, but I want to kind of anchor back that if you assume a 32 uh, multiple on what I think that they're going to earn next year, call it 720, you get to that 250. Their current multiple is about 25x. I think to go and campaign for a higher tech multiple in this environment seems like I am out of touch. But I do uh, believe that if we fast forward three, six, uh, 12 months from now, Assuming we do get through many of these headaches, I think that we will see multiple expansion. And I, I want to pause on that point. I think he just said a 32 multiple on Apple's earnings. That's how he's basing that price target off of next year. Uh, 32 multiple sounds insane to me. I actually do think this does sound a little bit crazy. Apple's trading at a 27 forward PE ratio, which many investors think is already very high. They look at Apple five years ago and they go, hey, five years ago, the multiple is like 15 or 16. It's trading at 27. So Apple's really overvalued now. Now they're not factoring in all the, the changes that Apple's done over the past five years, expanding their moat, expanding their margins, you know, doing all their subscription business, launching a ton of new products. But either way, 
the multiple has expanded from a 16, 17 to 27. And Gene's arguing now that the multiple is going to continue to expand from where it is at a 27 all the way up to a 32. Now, to me, that does seem like a little bit of a stretch. A 32 multiple on Apple seems a little bit excessive, but let's go ahead and hear him out. I think what it all keeps coming back to, Karen, is that that 250 number is really predicated on what we're seeing today is Apple's ability to continue to uh, put out great products. If they do that, upgrade existing products, come out with new products and enter new product categories, I feel that this is going to continue to surprise investors on the upside, uh, not only with earnings, but also multiple expansion. Gene, they announced Major League Baseball. At some point, there will be baseball. I think we all can agree on that. But the holy grail here is uh, National Football League. Does that get them closer to the NFL? It does. And just to put some perspective around this, is it is the holy grail NFL. Major League Baseball is about comparable in terms of advertising revenue versus the NBA. And when you think about the opportunity with the NFL, I think that that's definitely on the, the table here. And I would uh, put it this way, there's a high probability, I would say greater than 75% in the next one to two years, we're gonna see a deal with Apple. And it's, it's this simple, is that content continues to be king. Apple is gonna spend about 10 billion in content this year, Amazon about 15, Netflix about 20. And I think that the biggest opportunity for them really to uh, continue to activate a base of paying subs is through the NFL. And I'll put a little teaser on there too. I don't think they're going to stop at the NFL two to three years from now. I think that they're going to do Formula One. It's a sport that I don't watch, but a lot of people do. And it's uh, another example, I think, of how Apple can continue to expand beyond baseball, football, and other sports. Do you see what Gene is actually doing here as an analyst? I think this is why he stands apart from a lot of other analysts. Most analysts are looking quarter to quarter. They look at what the earnings are going to be next quarter, and then they do a basic P.E. ratio based off of that. That's how they value the company. But Gene's looking five, six years out. He notes that Apple's getting into sports, and this is likely to continue because Apple has infinitively deep pockets. They have Major League Baseball now. They have that on Apple TV+, Plus, on top of a growing library that started off small and kind of as a joke. A lot of investors scoff at it, but a growing library of TV shows and movies. They have a lot of content on there now that's continually growing. They're going to go for NFL. He says there's a 75% chance they will have some agreement with the NFL over the next two years. Then he doesn't think they're going to stop there. He thinks they're going to be doing Formula One racing and other events on it. I think Apple's going to continue to grow their Apple TV Plus service far more than investors are giving it credit right now. Apple's one of these companies that I think is the long-term compounders, the companies that have one revenue generator that seems extremely stable and solid that they can rely on. With Apple, it's the iPhone. They have the iPhone that they can continue to sell, make tons of money from. They can shovel that into content and now grow a streaming service and bring in a whole new type of revenue. It's not going to be perfect when they start it. Apple TV Plus is way behind Netflix or, you know, Disney or anything like that, but it will grow over time. $10 billion goes a long way. $15 billion for Amazon goes a very long ways. So these companies are going to continue to compound. Now, I want to highlight one last part of this interview and just share my thoughts on what Gene says here. And the second piece related to interest rates going up and the impact on valuation is they can manufacture higher earnings through uh, buybacks. So Gene says that Apple can, quote, manufacture earnings through buybacks. They can literally create whatever earnings they want. Well, how exactly does that work? Let's go ahead and look at it. First of all, we have to know that Apple is the most profitable company in the world by a landslide. None of them even come close. For example, we can look at Apple's most recent quarter, and they had $44.16 billion of free cash flow. That's the last quarter. $44 billion in free cash flow in one quarter. The low quarters, $16 billion, $19 billion, these are like the high quarters for Microsoft. So Apple is an enormously profitable company, unlike we've seen in any other company. And with all of this free cash flow, Apple uses it as a weapon to grow their earnings per share. Now, how do they accomplish this? So to really understand this, we have to go back to the basics. And I know you probably know this, but let's go over it just in case. The earnings per share is the amount of net income as the numerator divided by the amount of shares. It's the earnings per share. 
It's a basic formula. Now, when most people look at growing earnings of a company, they look at growing the net income. That's the thing that they focus on the most. You gotta grow the net income to grow the earnings because that numerator is the most important part. You wanna grow the earnings of the company, grow the net income. That's not really accurate. Another way that you can equally grow the earnings of the company is by reducing the denominator. So the earnings are divided by less shares outstanding. And the way that you reduce that denominator is by getting rid of shares, reducing the amount of shares outstanding. And that is something that Apple is very good at. If we look at their shares outstanding over time, this graph is a little bit deceiving because it includes stock splits. So when Apple did their stock split in 2020, that's not dilution. They're not diluting the shareholder. They split the stock, but then you also notice the trend here. Every single quarter, quarter over quarter, Apple reduces the total amount of shares outstanding. And again, going back to that formula, when you reduce the denominator, the amount of shares that it's divided by, it increases the earnings per share. So on Qualtrum, we can see that Apple is aggressively doing share buybacks. You can see this trend over time. 16.9, 16.8, 16.6, 16.5. This is in the billions. So they're buying back hundreds of millions of shares. 16.4 billion, 16.3 billion, every single quarter buying more and more shares back. Now, when you zoom out even more, here's a graphic of what this looks like over a bigger timetable. It is incredible. Apple is literally devouring their share count. They're reducing that denominator so much. They're eating up so many shares that the earnings have to be divided by less shares outstanding and the EPS continues to rocket up. So this earnings per share growth can be manufactured and Apple has just the right tool to manufacture it, which is an endless stream of free cash flow. They'll continue to buy back their shares aggressively, increasing their EPS. Now, are share buybacks always appropriate for every company in every situation? Of course not. In fact, share buybacks won't save a company that's clearly going into decline. If a company has lowered revenue over time, they're not growing their revenue, but it's going down. If they have lower net income over time, if they have increasing debt over time, but they're just doing share buybacks, that's not gonna save the company. It's not a save all for every company. So in Apple's situation, every other metric is going good. They're growing their revenue, they're growing their EBITDA, they're growing their free cash flow. Their debt's completely flat, it's not growing over time, and they're growing their dividends, but they're also doing aggressive share buybacks. So in this situation, share buybacks are a very good tool for Apple to use to continually grow their earnings over time. As they do share buybacks, you own more and more of the company because you're not splitting it with so many other shares. So every share that you buy and hold becomes a bigger and bigger portion of the company. Now, will Apple get all the way to that 32 Ford PE ratio? Will the multiple expand that much? And will the company go to $250 a share? I don't know. I really have no clue if the multiple is going to expand that much. But with Apple and the situation they're in right now, the ability for this company to manufacture its earnings through share buybacks, the list of products they're coming out with, and the potential long shots of the Apple car of AR and VR, all the new stuff that they can build, there is no way that I'm selling this company and locking in gains at a 27 PE ratio. No way I'm taking gains right now. This, in my opinion, is a long-term compounder. I don't see any reason to believe that the compounding is done. And in my opinion, this is one that I'm probably going to continue to hold for the next five to 10 years. So that's my thoughts overall. I hope you enjoyed this little catch up on Apple and I'll see you in the next one.